Hello and welcome to this concluding lecture of this lecture series on jet aircraft propulsion. So, we are currently on the 42nd lecture and uh, this would be the concluding lecture of this lecture series. So, the purpose of this lecture particular lecture is to primarily give you an overview of what we have been discussing in this course over the last 41 lectures and also partly to also introduce you to some of the concepts of aircraft propulsion which we might get to see in the future. So, we are going to discuss two distinct aspects of um, jet aircraft propulsion. One is of course, an overview of the jet propulsion system that we have discussed over several lectures now, which is what I would be covering. I would uh, be recapitulating um, topics that have been discussed uh, during this whole course. And uh, the second half of the course, which is going to be handled by Professor Roy, he would be uh, discussing about the future of jet aircraft propulsion, where he would be discussing about some of the concepts, some of the very promising concepts that uh, might that is something that we might see in a few years from now. And so, these are some of the topics that we are going to discuss. So, we will begin with an overview of the whole course and the course contents, wherein we will discuss about, well, well, I will just basically revise and revisit some of the topics that we have discussed uh, in very brief. And uh, so, as you have uh, already undergone the course uh, during the last 40 uh, odd lectures, what is it that you have basically discussed and learned? So, let us quickly recap what we have been discussing over these several uh, last several lectures. So, in today's lecture, uh, as I said, there are two distinct topics that we are going to discuss. One of them is, of course, uh, recapitulation of the course contents, and uh, the second part of the course is future of jet aircraft propulsion. So, the first few lectures that uh, we have had discussed in uh, during this course was devoted to introduction to the whole concept and subject of jet aircraft propulsion. We had uh, one lecture entirely devoted towards discussing uh, the history of jet aircraft propulsion, where we have seen how the jet engines as we see now have evolved over several years, close to about 60, 70 years of uh, development. We have seen how jet aircraft propulsion has developed uh, as a concept, from a concept to a fully flying jet aircraft engine, we have seen very complicated. The current modern day jet air aviation uh, uh, engines are very complicated to as compared to what were what they were supposed to have been many years from now. And uh, so, we have seen some of these uh, the, the evolution of jet aviation or jet aircraft engines uh, over the last uh, several decades to take a form that we see now. And in today's second half of today's lecture, we are going to see how jet aircraft engines are going to evolve or likely to evolve from now onwards. So, we, go, we have uh, primarily covered the entire spectrum of jet aircraft engines starting from its history, its uh, inception and uh, evolution and how jet engines have evolved to current day modern um, the military as well as civil aircraft engines, which are very complicated engines and devices and how is it that they are going to or likely to evolve over the next few years. So, we started our course with uh, an in depth discussion on the evolution of jet aircraft engines and then we have also seen how the jet aircraft propulsion systems have developed. How is it that jet engines have developed into an entire system which consists of several subsystems and several sub components. Then uh, in uh, next few lectures I will basically uh, when I am mean, saying that jet engine as a system consists of several subsystems what are these subsystems? In fact, we spend several lectures on each of these modules or subsystems of the jet engine as a whole. We have had discussion, uh, very detailed discussion on the components like the compressors, the turbines, combustion chambers, intakes and the nozzles. So, each of these um, components constitute the subsystem of the whole system, which is the jet engine. And it is necessary that all these components put together work as a single unit which is why towards the end of the course, we also had some discussion on matching of these components, because it is uh, the design and development of individual components are done by separate groups and uh, eventually if they all have to put in, if they all have to be put into a single engine and the engine has to successfully run and develop 
uh, a certain uh, the designed thrust then it is very much necessary that all these components work together as a unit and not as individual components. Because as designers of let us say the compressor, the compressor group would obviously try to maximize the efficiency of the compressor and that is true for all other components as well. But ultimately when they are all put together, it is not the individual efficiencies that alone matter, but how these components match with the other components and all of them put together. Uh, generate the required thrust and also with a high amount of efficiency. So, that is why we had to discuss these components in detail. Now, subsequent to this we uh, discussed about some of the fundamental equations that we were using throughout the course. These were to do with the performance of jet engines themselves. How do we evaluate a jet engine? Now, now that we have designed a jet engine, how can we evaluate and say that this jet engine is going to meet its requirement? Well, there are a few basic parameters that these jet engines are evaluated based on. One of them obviously is the thrust, because the primary purpose of a jet engine is to generate thrust, so that the aircraft can be propelled forward. So, thrust is one of the primary um, performance parameters. We have derived the thrust equation, we have seen how from starting from first principles, we can derive a generalized thrust equation. And of course, we have used this equation throughout the course. Basically, the, the thrust equation consists of two uh, distinct terms. One is the momentum thrust, which is basically mass flow rate times 1 plus f, that is the fuel flow rate into m dot uh, plus uh, into the jet exhaust velocity u e minus u. So, this is the momentum thrust. Second component of the thrust is the pressure thrust, which is area times p e minus p a. And of course, pressure thrust is usually much smaller as compared to the momentum thrust. So, thrust is in general the product of mass flow rate times 1 plus f into u e minus u. So, we have derived this equation and of course, we have used this equation for um, the different types of engines that we have discussed and uh, subsequent to the thrust equation. So, thrust being one of the um, most important parameters, performance parameters, what are the other parameters? So, how much fuel does an engine consume to develop the thrust? So, that is the second parameter that we have discussed that is specific fuel consumption and uh, besides fuel consumption, there are also efficiencies which come into picture. The different types of efficiencies like thermal efficiency, the uh, propulsion efficiency and the overall efficiency. So, these are some of the parameters we have been discussed and we have also derived equations for determining how, or, how, how we can calculate these parameters. So, in the first two or three lectures, we have discussed on some of these topics with the history of propulsion, development of jet aircraft propulsion systems, the thrust generation and performance evaluation based on thrust and specific thrust, specific fuel consumption and TSFC or thrust specific fuel consumption and the efficiencies, the propulsion efficiency, thermal efficiency and overall efficiency. Subsequent to this, we had an overview of the different types of engines. How can we classify engines based on uh, certain parameters? One of the ways of classifying engine is based on the number of spools or shaft that the engine has. So, an engine could have a single spool in which all the rotating components like the compressors and turbines and fans and all of them are mounted on the same shaft. So, that is known as a single spool engine. A multi spool engine on the other hand would have a multiple number of shafts. That is, there would be a compressor, a high pressure compressor driven by a high pressure turbine, then the low pressure compressor driven by a low pressure turbine and so on. So, there would be num uh, num multiple number of uh, these shafts or spools. Typically, there could be, they could be either two spool or three spool and not more than that. So, you could have engines which have either a single spool or it could be two spool or three spool. Of course, in principle it is possible to have more number of them, but practically it is known that having more and more number of spools does not really help. So, that was one way of classifying the set of engines. The other classification is based on the type of engines themselves. So, the most fundamental form of engine that we know is the turbojet engine. So, turbojet engine is uh, probably the simplest of the jet engines besides of course, the ramjet and pulse jet. So, those engines which have rotating components, turbojet is the simplest of them. 
a turbojet engine typically consists of a compressor then the combustion chamber turbine and nozzle and of course there is an intake head of the compressor turbojets may op operate with or without preheat or after burning so a turbojet engine with after burning used normally in military aircraft where these aircraft would have to operate at supersonic speeds so if an aircraft has to operate at supersonic speeds we would need to use um, after burning or reheat so uh, so as to enable the engine to generate additional thrust and accelerate it to supersonic speeds so besides the turbojet with after burning the most common form of civil aircraft engine that is used is the turbofan engine so most of the modern day um, larger sized engines or aircraft would be flying with a turbofan engine a turbofan engine is very similar to a turbojet uh, besides the fact that ahead of the compressor we would also have a fan so a fan generates a bypass mass flow it's a cold mass flow and again turbofan might be either mixed mode or an unmixed mode and so there is a cold stream which may or may not mix with the hot exhaust before it exits from the engine so turbofan is a, more, a very commonly used uh, engine for civil aviation then the other commonly used form uh, of engine for civil aviation is the turboprop engine that is we have a propeller which is driven by a turbine and uh, so it's like a turbojet engine with a propeller in front of it so turbo uh, prop engines gen primarily generate thrust using the propellers but they may also have some component of jet thrust then uh, the other variant of the jet engine is the turbo shaft engine turbo shaft engines are used in helicopters so there is no jet thrust here so the entire uh, one of the turbines uh, is exclusively meant to drive the main rotor blade of uh, the uh, helicopter and so such engines are called turbo shaft engines because they generate shaft power and not jet thrust so we had some uh, discussion an overview of these different types of engines and uh, we saw what is it how is it that we can distinguish between these different types of engines subsequent to that we started the thermodynamic analysis of jet engines we had discussed about uh, the basic thermodynamic cycle of jet engines we have seen that the basic thermodynamic cycle based on which an engine operates is the brayton cycle so we have seen what is a brayton cycle and how we can represent a brayton cycle an ideal brayton cycle on a process diagram based on pressure volume or temperature entropy plots so we have seen an ideal brayton cycle and represented its process on pv and ts plots we also seen the salient features of the cycle that what are the different processes which constitute a brayton cycle an ideal brayton cycle consists of isentropic compression then constant pressure heat addition isentropic expansion and constant pressure heat rejection so these are the different processes which constitute an ideal brayton cycle we have also seen the real brayton cycle and the process cycle uh, process diagram for a real brayton cycle we have seen the sources of irreversibilities and what makes uh, an a real brayton cycle that is there are irreversibilities in the compression expansion process there could be pressure loss taking place in the heat addition process and so on we have then discussed about the um, extension of the brayton cycle to jet engines brayton cycle forms the basic thermodynamic cycle and how can we extend that to an actual jet engines so actual all jet engines operate based on brayton cycle but of course there are modifications or differences between the pure ideal brayton cycle as compared to the jet engine cycle the fundamental difference is that a brayton cycle is a closed loop or um, closed loop cycle whereas um, the jet engine cycle is an open cycle of course uh, with the air standard assumptions we still use um we can still approximate the jet engine cycle to be a, a brayton cycle so we have carried out we have carried out very detailed analysis of these um, thermodynamic cycles in terms of cycle analysis for both the ideal version of the jet engine as well as the real version of the jet engine cycle analysis as we have seen involves uh, calculating properties across individual components uh, which will eventually give us the thrust and fuel consumption there are certain parameters which are fixed design parameters like the ambient condition then the compressor pressure ratio turbine inlet temperature 
and these are some of the parameters which are fixed a priori and based on these parameters and using cycle analysis we can evaluate uh, or judge the performance of jet engines uh, from a cycle analysis. We have done this for both the idealized version as well as for the real version. Real version also includes efficiencies which are introduced uh, as a result of uh, irreversibilities in various components like intake efficiency uh, because compression in an intake can be non-isentropic. Then there is a compression, uh, compressor efficiency, isentropic efficiency of a compressor. Then there could be efficiency of the combustion, pressure loss in the burner or combustor, turbine efficiency and the nozzle efficiency. So, we have associated efficiencies with all the components because in an actual in actual practice we know that none of these components are going to perform ideally or in a um, isentropic manner like the, the compression or expansion process are never isentropic. So, we have associated efficiencies with all these components. Once you associate efficiencies we can still carry out the cycle analysis in a very similar manner as for an ideal cycle but we have these efficiencies inbuilt into them. But um, cycle analysis um, helps us in the sense that it is probably the starting point of a design of a jet engine itself. Based on the cycle analysis we can evaluate whether the jet engine is going to deliver the performance that is being required for this particular application like in terms of thrust and efficiency and fuel consumption. So, cycle analysis is a means for achieving some of these uh, preliminary design parameters. So, after cycle analysis we started our discussion on individual components. We have several components which constitute jet engine. One of the components uh, one of the important components is the compressor. So, we first discussed about the rotating components. So, there are two distinct rotating components in a jet engine the compressor and the turbine. We first discussed about these two components and then we took up the non-rotating components like the combustion chamber, intakes and the in nozzles. So, in compressors we first started off with a thermodynamic analysis of compression process itself or the thermodynamics of compression. We have seen how we can explain compression process taking place through a rotor stator combination and uh, how the pressure rise is achieved as a flow passes through a compressor. Then we also saw that there are two distinct types of compressors the axial compressor and the centrifugal compressor. We have had a uh, very detailed discussion on both these types of uh, compressors. We started off with the axial compressor where we had discussion on a 2D analysis a simplified 2D analysis of flow in a, an axial compressor stage that is a rotor and a stator combination. So, we first started off with a 2D analysis and then we discussed about what is known as cascade aerodynamics. Cascade aerodynamics is uh, basically uh, a method by which one can evaluate test compressor blades on a two dimensional scale before taking it to uh, complicated uh, rotating rig. We have then seen what are the different performance parameters for evaluating a blade performance. We then discussed about the free vortex theory which is something that is used for evaluate for designing a compressor stage where basically the product of the radius times the tangential velocity uh, is equal to a constant based on that we can design a blade from the hub to the tip. We then discussed about the performance characteristics of single and multi stage axial compressors that that is when we discussed about the instability mechanisms like rotating stall and surge and that is why a performance characteristics would typically have a surge line beyond which on the left hand side of which we the compressor performance is unstable. Subsequent to axial compressors we discussed about centrifugal compressors and uh, in centrifugal compressor we have seen the different components of a centrifugal compressor like it has an inducer, it has an impeller and diffuser. We have had detailed discussion on these individual components and how we can analyze flow passing through uh, the inducer and the impeller and finally, the diffuser. So, we have seen the different components of a centrifugal compressor. We have also discussed about instabilities that can occur in a centrifugal compressor like uh, surging and another limit to mass flow that is choking. So, centrifugal compressor performance in relation to these two uh, limits of operation the surge line on one side and choking line on the other side these two limit the performance of um, compressors in general. 
So, this was about compressors, we had uh, spent a few lectures on uh, discussion on these topics on both types of compressor, the axle as well as the centrifugal compressor. Now, subsequent to compressor, we took up the turbine that is the next rotating component. So, in turbine again we had a similar procedure followed, we started off with the thermodynamics of turbines. We have seen how turbines can generate work output uh, by expanding a hot uh, uh, combustion products through them. Thermodynamics of turbines was discussed in detail in one of the lectures and then we discussed about two distinct types of turbines, the axial turbine and the radial turbine. In axial turbine again we have discussed two dimensional analysis of blades or cascade analysis of flow through these blades. We have then discussed about multi staging of axial turbines and performance characteristics of turbines and unlike compressors there are no instabilities that limit performance of turbines like uh, surge or stall, but they do have a performance characteristic. Then very important aspect of turbine is the turbine blade cooling because we have seen turbine inlet temperature is a limiting parameter, but higher the turbine inlet temperature better is the performance. So, how can we increase the turbine inlet temperature and without exceeding the material limits. So, one of the ways of doing that is by cooling the turbine blades. So, we have seen in detail what are the methods available for uh, blade cooling in turbines and using that how we can improve the turbine inlet temperature therefore, increase the performance of uh, the engine as a whole. Then we have discussed the radial turbines which are less popularly used, axial turbines are commonly used. Even in the case of compressors, axial compressors are normally used in larger sized engines whereas, centrifugal compressors uh, tend to be better option for smaller sized engines. In turbines on the other hand, axial turbines are more commonly used in both larger as well as in smaller sized engines, but radial turbines are also sometimes used. And a radial turbine is exactly like very similar to uh, that of a centrifugal compressor in, in terms of its appearance and uh, so the components or constituents of radial turbine, we have seen the elements that constitute a radial turbine and how we can evaluate the performance of radial turbine in terms of the performance parameters. So, these were uh, two distinct components, the rotating components of jet engines, the axial compressors and then well axial compressors, centrifugal compressors, similarly turbines, axial and radial turbines. And after we discussed about the rotating components, we then took up the non-rotating components and so we started off with the combustion chamber that is one of the non-rotating components. So, combustion chamber is the um, heat addition unit of uh, if you look at the Brayton cycle, there is one process which involves heat addition. So, combustion chamber is the part of that Brayton cycle where heat addition takes place. We have seen the mechanism of combustion chamber itself and what are the different types of combustion chambers. There are can type combustion chamber, there are can annular type of combustion chamber and the annular type of combustion chamber. So, we have seen in detail the geometric construction of these three types of combustion chamber and then we also discussed about the performance of combustion chamber, how we can evaluate performance using stagnation pressure laws that is one of the performance parameter, the combustion efficiency is another parameter and also the combustion intensity. So, using three of these parameters one can evaluate the performance of combustion chambers. We also saw in some detail how we can evaluate stability of combustion as well as the flammability limits which is why one has a peculiar design for a combustion chamber to ensure that the combustion is stable within the uh, limits of the combustion chamber. We also had a um, brief discussion on the fuel injection mechanism in combustion chamber and uh, how we can um, inject fuel in an efficient manner so that the fuel and air mix efficiently before the combustion begins. So, we had uh, a rather detailed discussion on the combustion chamber on all of these aspects and we have seen what are the advantages and disadvantages of these di three different types of combustion chambers that we have uh, discussed. So, subsequent to combustion chamber, we had a uh, couple of uh, lectures or in, on intakes. Intakes constitute the first component of uh, jet engine and so we had some detailed discussion on types of intakes and their performance as well. So, we have discussed intakes that are used for transport as well as military aircraft and what are the different types of intakes. 
one may have subsonic intakes or supersonic intakes we have seen their designs intakes could either be fixed geometry or they could be variable geometry we have also seen what is a 2d and an axisymmetric intake we then took up a discussion on subsonic and supersonic intake separately we have seen the working of subsonic intake and operation of subsonic intake in different operating conditions like takeoff or cruise in supersonic intakes we had discussion on three different types of intakes the external compression the internal compression and the mixed compression intake we have discussed about the starting problem associated with supersonic intakes and also the modes of operation of uh, uh, supersonic intakes like subcritical the critical and supercritical modes of uh, operation of uh, supersonic intakes so after intakes with the other component that we had for discussion the last component of a jet engine that is the nozzle so similar to intakes we also classified nozzles in different types we could have fixed or nozzles or variable type nozzles one may have convergent type of nozzle or converging divergent type nozzles we have seen the operating principle behind these different types of nozzle like convergent nozzle is used for subsonic flows whereas cd nozzle or convergent divergent type nozzle is used in supersonic flows and why is it that we need to use these two types of nozzles for separate types of flows we have seen the operation of these nozzles we have also seen different functions of nozzle besides of course generating thrust there are other functions that nozzles have to uh, satisfy in modern jet engines like thrust reversal thrust vectoring in um, combat aircraft and nozzles are also used for vertical or short takeoff and landing by deflection of the nozzles appropriately we also seen one of the functions of modern day jet engine nozzles is also for also in controlling the jet noise to some extent by appropriately shaping the nozzle um, exit area and so nozzle uh, jet noise jet noise control also happens to be one of the functions of modern day jet engines and uh, so after we have completed all the discussion on different components we had some in depth discussion on the engine of design operation those these engines are designed to operate under certain conditions obviously we know that they have to undergo operation under all other kinds of design uh, other, other kinds of conditions or uh, which are referred to as off design operation so we have seen what are the associated problems associated with um, off design operation of an engine and why is it important that we have a proper matching of different components and uh, we have seen in the beginning of the lecture i mentioned that even though these components are designed as individual units by separate teams eventually they all have to put be put in place in a single engine they have to operate efficiently as one unit so component matching is a very important aspect so we have seen a dimension analysis which can be done to identify significant non dimensional par parameters which can be used for uh, component matching then we also discussed about matching as well as sizing of uh, jet engines and then we have seen the install performance and how we can evaluate install performance of engines because engines may be designed to evaluate to develop a certain um, performance level but once they are installed in an aircraft the performance uh, would be different from what they have been designed for so how we can evaluate performance of uh, the install performance of engines then uh, towards the end of the lecture series we had some discussion we have spent a few lectures on discussing about some other types of engines uh, which are obviously very simple at least in um, design on paper they are very simple like ramjets pulse jets and scramjets because they do not have any rotating machinery and so we have discussed about um, what are the uses of ramjets and uh, pulse jets we have seen the thermodynamic cycle of ramjets and pulse jets and we have seen how we can evaluate performance of ramjets and pulse jets based on cycle analysis we have then taken up a detailed desired discussion on the components that constitute these engines like the intake the combustion chamber and the nozzle and how we can go about designing some of these components we have also discussed about different types of ramjets and pulse jets that like we have we may have solid fuel ramjets or liquid fuel or gaseous fueled one may have integral rocket ramjet combination or one may have um, some of the other forms of ramjets the ejector ramjet and so on so we have discussed in brief about some of these concepts and also different types of pulse jets like valved and valveless pulse jet as well as uh, the conceptual engine the, the pulse detonation engines 
So, we also had uh, a few um, slides on discussion on design aspects of ramjets as well as scramjets. So, these were some of the topics that we took up for discussion towards the end of the lecture series in the last few lectures. And so, uh, what we have discussed in, uh, just now is uh, an overview of the different topics that we have been discussing um, during the last 41 lectures that we have had so far. And I have just given you an overview of the different um, topics, different um, chapters that we have covered uh, over several of these lectures. So, uh, in the next part of the lecture, which will be taken up by Professor Roy, he will give you an overview of uh, where the aviation uh, the aircraft jet propulsion is taking us to and the future of jet aircraft engines and what are the different types of engines that we are likely to see uh, in the uh, future and in a few years from now. So, some of these topics will be taken up for discussion by Professor Roy in the next part of the lecture. Over this lecture series, we have been talking about various kinds of jet engines for powering aircraft to flight. We just had an overview of what we have covered in uh, a little more than 40 lectures in this lecture series by Professor Pradeep. I will try to give a very brief glimpse to you of what the future holds for us in this area of jet engines for powering aircraft to various kinds of flight situations. We have seen over the uh, last uh, lecture series in this lecture series over the last few uh, lectures that there are various kinds of engines that take us all the way up to uh, hypersonic speeds. The man of course, started flying at very low speed uh, with the Wright brothers flying about 107 years back and that was a very low speed flight. Over the years, we have learned what are the possibilities, what are the options that we have, what kind of jet engines are good and fuel efficient and which are the ones which are probably not that efficient. The ones which are not very uh, efficient have kind of fallen on the wayside and we are now looking at various kinds of options that are available not only which are fuel efficient, but also which has the possibility to take us to uh, higher flight speeds and probably flying at various uh, kinds of operating conditions. Let us take a quick look at what are the options that we have for various kinds of jet engines. You see, when you have the turbofans which are operating at uh, subsonic speeds to high, high subsonic speeds to transonic speeds, let us say, they are the most efficient devices of jet engines for powering aircraft. However, it is generally felt that once you cross about Mach 2 or 2.5, the turbofans probably would become less and less efficient and the pure turbojets would actually uh, be the more efficient device. In view of the fact that the aircraft that fly at very high altitude also be experiencing very high drags. So, the drag penalty for the thrust creation become a little prohibitive with turbofans and then pure turbojets essentially become more useful devices. However, once you cross Mach 3.5, uh, you are looking for devices that are even more uh, uh, efficient in terms of uh, less drag penalty and reasonable thrust production and then you are looking at devices like ramjets. Now, these ramjets will take you to up to Mach uh, 5 or so and at about Mach 5 or so, even the ramjets become uh, problematic because the flow which is highly supersonic outside, once they are inside, uh, they have to be made subsonic in a ramjet uh, for the combustion purpose and then uh, making them subsonic, uh, it becomes a highly loss making proposition and then the scramjets come into picture where you do not have to make them subsonic and they can remain supersonic and you have supersonic combustion that allows you to go sc through scramjets and allows you to go through uh, hypersonic speeds up to Mach 10 or so. Now, this is the spectrum which mankind has already conquered. We already have flights through the entire spectrum from very low subsonic to hypersonic speeds 
uh, hypersonic flight X 15 uh, and X 15 A has been successfully flown last year. And this clearly tells us that various kinds of jet engines that we have been talking about are indeed already flying and successful devices. However, there are some riders. These riders are that the ramjets and scramjets, even though they are very good at very high supersonic speeds, you cannot use them for taking off. They are not good at low subsonic speeds and they are really speaking of no use when the aircraft is taking off. So, an aircraft cannot take off when powered by ramjets or scramjets. As I mentioned, the first powered flight of hypersonic aircraft has taken off uh, last year and it flew for about 3.5 minutes, 3.5 minutes, which is more than what the Wright brothers flew 107 years back in their low subsonic first flight of mankind. So, let us look at what are the options that we have for various kinds of flight situations. At low subsonic flight conditions, it is pretty much uh, understood that high bypass turbofans are the most efficient devices. We have covered all the bypass engines and it is pretty much understood now that unless you have a high bypass turbofan engine, the flights under subsonic flow conditions are not going to be very efficient. So, high bypass and higher the bypass, more efficient they are, more fuel efficient they are. So, that is the option we have for low, uh, low subsonic to medium subsonic flight conditions. However, the military aircraft which often fly under uh, high subsonic to transonic and low supersonic speeds for various military operations have started using low bypass turbofan engine. Even though for a long time they were using only turbojet engines, they have now started using low bypass turbofan engines and that gives them the slight fuel advantage. The turbofan or the bypass always gives a certain slight fuel advantage over a pure turbojet and this slight fuel advantage has been used by the military aircraft engines up to Mark II, uh, giving them uh, more operational flexibility, more range of operation uh, and more time in flight. Uh, and these are the things that military aircraft would uh, be beneficial uh, when using uh, turbofan engines. And these turbofan engines as we have seen are essentially very low bypass, low bypass ratio not only less than 1, sometimes even less than 0.5. Uh, in so far as sometimes they are even called leaking bypass engines. So, those are the engines that are normally used for military aircraft uh, operations, uh, which are mostly uh, supersonic uh, aircraft. The other kind of engine that is uh, already been talked about and we have introduced uh, that to you and that is the ultra high bypass engine. Now, these ultra high bypass engines are of uh, very high bypass uh, way past the values like 6, which have been used uh, even till recently uh, in jumbo and uh, Boeing 777 and Airbus and, uh, aircraft. However, these ultra high bypass engines were actually test flown way back in 1989 and more than 20 years back. Uh, however, they are uh, still not used in a big way in various commercial aircraft even today. And one of the reasons is that these ultra high bypass engines have two uh, problems that uh, require a good solution. One is that they make a lot of noise and the noise regulations these days are very stringent uh, in various aircraft around the world. Uh, the noise regulations are so stringent that in some of the airports, uh, those which are noisy aircraft are not even allowed to land or take off. So, these ultra high bypass that was one of the problems that they were making a lot of noise, especially during takeoff and landing. The other problem was that they were indeed having a lot of drag penalty. You see bigger the uh, engine, more is the engine uh, diameter or the fan diameter. Now, more is the diameter, more is the drag penalty of the engine itself, which adds to the aircraft drag penalty. And when you have uh, together, you, uh, you have a lot of drag penalty, which as we have talked about before, the uh, engine itself has to overcome that uh, extra drag. Now, this was a little problem and um, this is another reason why uh, 
the ultra high bypass engines have not yet come into being. We will talk about today one kind of ultra high bypass engine that is likely to uh, make the commercial flight very soon, uh, which uses uh, a new technology, uh, both new kind of design and of course, a new kind of mechanical arrangement, which allows them to go towards high uh, ultra high bypass uh, configuration. The other possibilities that people are talking about is as we just mentioned, the scramjets and the ramjets are not good enough for aircraft to take off and land. Obviously, for take off land low subsonic, high subsonic and then through transonic speeds and low supersonic speeds, uh, the best option is always the turbofan engine. Now, what people have uh, conceived is a combination of uh, turbofan or turbojet with ramjet or scramjet and that combination is what is taking shape these days, which will allow an aircraft to take off, go through uh, low subsonic, high subsonic, go through uh, supersonic speeds, low supersonic speeds and then all the way flight to uh, ultra high uh, supersonic speeds that is hypersonic speeds. And in, in those uh, uh, phases, it will operate as various kinds of engine. It will start off as ordinary turbofan engine, then turbojet engine, then ramjet engine and finally, a scramjet engine. So, we will take a look at some of these options and how they look like uh, in, in terms of what they are being conceived of as of today. When we look at this uh, particular diagram, which tells us what the specific thrust or specific impulse is uh, compared to various kinds of uh, jet engines. We can see that the normal cruise range that today we are talking about from subsonic to uh, hypersonic speeds, it encompasses all the kinds of jet engines that we are talking about. It encompasses the turbojets, the ramjets and it starts to utilize the scramjets and we also see that we have a choice between two kinds of fuel, the hydrocarbon fuel and the hydrogen fuel. The liquid hydrogen, which is uh, available uh, for a long time and has been used in rockets for a long time, we can see that they can be attractive fuel uh, for other kinds of jet engines also. Um, and they indeed actually give better specific uh, thrust or specific impulse. Uh, the red uh, zone there actually co contribute are contributed by the hydrogen fuel. The trouble with them is the hydrogen fuel or the liquid hydrogen is light and as a result carrying a certain mass of fuel would require more volume and hence more space in the aircraft. Now, that is something which till today the aircraft designers are not ready to concede that extra, extra volume or extra space. Uh, to the hydrogen fuel and as and when that issue is resolved, it is probable that uh, we will move from hydrocarbon fossil fuel to liquid hydrogen, uh, which of course, uh, is indeed a better uh, fuel by all considerations. So, even then we have the choice of using uh, turbofans, turbojets and then ramjets and scramjets. So, the cruise range that we are talking about from subsonic to hypersonic is an essentially can be covered by these three varieties of jet engines. Let us take a look at what a combination engine would indeed look like, which will take one single aircraft all the way from takeoff to uh, subsonic to supersonic and then to hypersonic speeds. Now, this is a concept which people have been talking about for some time that you have a turbojet or indeed even a turbofan embedded inside a large uh, ramjet uh, engine, which is very large in size and uh, that ramjet uh, actually would operate essentially in hyper, hypersonic or very high supersonic uh, flight conditions, but till such time as that, it is the turbojet or a, a low bypass turbofan would provide the thrust for the uh, flight of the aircraft. Now, this embedded uh, turbojet or turbofan uh, would be much smaller in size. Uh, it will exhaust into the combustion chamber of the ramjet 
and during low speed flights that is subsonic or even low supersonic flights <coughs> the ramjet operation may be either suspended completely or very lightly operated to add just a little bit of fuel to the exhaust of the turbojet engine to provide a uh, little more uh, impetus to the thrust uh, the flow that is coming out from the nozzle indeed nozzle of the ramjet. So, that would provide a necessary thrust for flight of the aircraft. Now, that is the combination which people have been talking about and this is a concept which uh, came up quite some time back little more than 20, 25 years back. However, the concept has moved forward a little and we can take a look at what are the modern uh, version of these concepts indeed look like. In this, uh, the concept was taken forward that is about 10, 15 years back in which the turbojet is buried inside a sized ramjet and this was questioned as ramjet wrapped around a turbojet. Indeed, the ramjet is uh, spread around a, a turbojet engine um, and the outer periphery of the engine essentially operates like a ramjet uh, in so far as you have uh, a diffuser over here uh, which allows the flow to come through the intake system into the turbojet and then it flies uh, and the flows through the turbojet engine and comes out as a hot jet from the turbojet uh, which then may have a little bit of fuel addition here more like after burner and then the flow goes through the large nozzle of the jet overall engine as a thrust creating jet. However, when the aircraft is flying at uh, hypersonic speeds this uh, turbojet uh, flow may be blocked and the entire flow coming through the intake and the diffuser system which then would be a supersonic diffuser or intake uh, would indeed go straight into the ramjet configuration and it, it would come through this bypass system into the ramjet uh, combustion chamber and from there it will flow like a ramjet engine through the convergent divergent nozzle that you see here producing uh, hot thrust for the entire flow uh, with the combustion taking place in ramjet mode. Now, that is the kind of uh, convertible engine uh, which people have been uh, conceiving for uh, quite some time and this conception has now taken place in a little more uh, elaborate way in this form. Now, in this form of the engine the flow as I mentioned comes through a uh, intake system and then through this intake system it gets into the ramjet uh, which is operating at low Mach number either subsonic or low supersonic and then it goes through the normal uh, compressor combustion chamber and turbine uh, the normal uh, ramjet turbojet uh, or turbofan engine configuration and then it goes through the jet pipe and the nozzle of the turbojet engine which is then placed in a manner uh, pretty close to the uh, nozzle of the uh, ramjet engine which then operates in a manner that uh, in a is convenient to the uh, turbojet engine operation which means the flow from here could be uh, going straight out through the nozzle without uh, going out through a convergent divergent nozzle. So, this nozzle could be uh, a, a straight out nozzle a divergent nozzle coming through the convergent nozzle from here and then from here onwards uh, it is a divergent nozzle which allows the uh, aircraft to actually fly uh, straight through from subsonic to supersonic uh, flight operation. So, you could have a uh, effective convergent divergent nozzle that means the nozzle of the turbojet engine is essentially convergent and then through the uh, roger, uh, nozzle of the ramjet it could become a divergent producing uh, essentially uh, thrust for the entire aircraft. However, in high Mach number that is under uh, high supersonic to hypersonic flight conditions as you can see now the ramjet is, uh, is operational in a ramjet mode and the turbojet is completely blocked. So, the compressor turbine combustion chamber combination of the ramjet is now completely off and uh, effectively it is switched off or it is not operational anymore and the entire flow that is coming through this system it is coming from high supersonic uh, flight conditions and as a result it comes to this system goes into this uh, bypass mode 
goes through the entire duct and goes into the combustion chamber and then flies out uh, flows out in a convergent divergent mode uh, producing thrust for hypersonic flight. So, that is the conception that is taking place. It is probably going to take a few more years to solve all the technological issues, so that we have an, a convertible engine that will take mankind all the way from uh, take off to hypersonic mode of flight. And it is something which everybody is waiting for to happen, probably it will happen in another 5 to 10 years time, uh, before which uh, we have to have uh, different kinds of engines for different kinds of flight situations. The other kind of engine that I was talking about is the ultra high bypass uh, turbofan engine, which is taking shape now and uh, is probably uh, almost ready for commercial application probably very shortly within a, a couple of years probably. And this uses uh, what is known as counter rotating unducted fan blades. These counter rotating unducted fan blades uh, produce uh, ultra high bypass essentially uh, ultra high bypass engine. Now, here what I am showing, showing you here is unducted fan blades oh, indeed it could be ducted as well. The counter rotating fan blades allow the fan blades to run at a somewhat higher speeds. Um, in the process the size of the uh, thrust producing uh, fans could actually be reduced and hence uh, you can even think of ducting them. And as a result of the reduction of the size, the mechanical complexities and some of the mechanical issues are reduced and, and a good design and a good aerodynamic uh, configuration has allowed to reduce the noise substantially. So, that they are uh, now compliant with the noise regulations uh, that are in force uh, all over the world. So, this kind of counter rotating uh, unducted or ducted fan blades uh, would produce ultra high bypass turbofan engines with a bypass ratio of the order of uh, up to even 14. And these are as you can see here, one fan is mounted on one set of uh, turbines and this fan, the counter rotating fan is mounted on another set of turbines and these turbine rotors are counter rotating and they are in a certain operational mode and the design uh, actually excludes all uh, usage of uh, stators or stator nozzles as we know essentially these sets of turbines essentially uh, do not use any stator nozzles. Uh, they are counter rotating rotors enmeshed in each other and hence uh, they are is a statorless configurations. So, these statorless turbine configurations uh, would probably power the counter rotating unducted uh, or ducted fan blades uh, for the future ultra high bypass turbofan engines. The other kind of engine that has been taking place for some time is also referred to as lift fan and in this kind of lift fan, uh, the lifting fan which you see here at the front of the engine can actually be tilted. So, some people even like to call it tilt rotor. So, this provides direct lift uh, for the lift of the aircraft uh, allows the aircraft to <coughs> have uh, vertical takeoff or short takeoff and landing, whereas uh, this operates as a uh, straightforward jet engine uh, or turbofan engine providing uh, lift for uh, forward thrust. Once the aircraft is uh, airborne and has li been lifted off the ground, this uh, lift fan can turn around by 90 degree and start providing uh, forward thrust. So, the uh, delivery from this lift fan would indeed go into the jet engine and provide forward thrust. So, this lift fan is tiltable by 90 degree. So, in during takeoff and landing, it can operate to give direct lift to the aircraft while flying, it actually provides direct forward thrust for flying of the aircraft. Whereas, the other picture that we see here is more of a use for vertical takeoff and landing, where the basic engine provides a mechanical power to uh, drive this big lift fan, which uh, is uh, embedded uh, probably in the wing of the aircraft and um, this provides direct lift to the flight uh, for the takeoff of the aircraft. And then once it is taken off, 
this engine which as you can see is much smaller actually provides the forward uh, motion or the forward thrust of the aircraft. So, this is more of a low speed aircraft um, configuration where a small amount of forward thrust will uh, move it forward whereas, the big lift fan here provides the lifting arrangement for vertical uh, takeoff and landing purpose. So, these are some of the engines that have also been uh, designed and even test flown. Uh, <coughs> however, they have not been commercially used for uh, any aircraft uh, so far. Uh, there are mechanical complexities, there are fuel efficiency complexities which uh, yet to be uh, solved to satisfaction and hence even though they are considered to be successful engines, they have not yet been used uh, in a big way in commercial flights uh, in any kind of aircraft. But some of the issues are likely to be resolved in years to come and we will probably some see some of these lift span also operational in various kinds of aircraft. In future, for the aircraft to be successfully flown, we need to have three very important points in our mind. One, it must have very high fuel efficiency or low specific fuel consumption, which means that every component of the engine that is the intake, compressor, combustion chamber, turbine and nozzle, all of them have very high efficiency of operation. That is absolutely necessary to have high fuel efficiency during all kinds of operation not only during design point, but also during various off design operating critical operating conditions. The other important point is the low emission or pollution content. Uh, the present regulations very clearly state that it must have lower and lower emission or pollution uh, from the engines. The third important point of course, is the noise. Engines have always been very noisy the first jet engines were extremely noisy, but now uh, the regulations uh, very stringently stipulate that you have very low noise. So, many of the engines that are being created today are also being referred to as green engines because they are less pollutant and they are less noise making. So, these green engines are now making uh, the ground and more and more of the engines we will see would be the green engines make less pollution and less noise. So, that is the future that is uh, holding out for us and we shall see some of these engines in near future flying around and I am sure some of you would be flying on those aircraft. In this lecture series, we have tried to bring to you the very um, attractive and, and uh, very challenging field of jet engines, which has been powering aircraft for more than 50 years and taken mankind from low subsonic to hypersonic uh, flights. I hope you have been able to enjoy some of the uh, things, some of the theories and some of the discussions that we have uh, had in this lecture series and I hope some of you would find it attractive enough to choose uh, jet engines or aircraft jet engines as your carrier choice. We wish you all the luck and hope that uh, you would find uh, this course attractive enough to follow it up with more studies um, in your future career.